it was actually a Chinese press that uh, created this term, you mm. as the, the American vassal. And I think this may lead China to certain strategic uh, miscalculations if it thinks that actually uh, all changes and more assertiveness towards China is uh, made by Europe, US pressure. Hello, my name is Nicholas Furnival. You are watching or listening to an OSW interview. Today I'm talking to Paulina Uznańska from OSW's China department. We'll be discussing EU-China relations. Hi, Paulina. Hi. If we want to discuss Chinese-EU relations, I'd like first of all to find out what exactly that means. When the EU deals with China, does it do it as a bloc or does it do it more as the independent member states? Oh, that's actually a great question because that's a big thing in the EU-China relations. By nature, China and the EU are very different actors. Mm -hmm. And China is usually asking this question, if I want to talk to the EU, who do I call? As in... And Henry Kissinger. <laughs> exactly. There, uh, there are certain EU bodies that are responsible for dealing uh, with uh, China. Mm -hmm. But in general, uh, China is also very efficient in navigating which member states are more willing to accept certain uh, offers mm -hmm. or certain policies that would be in Chinese interests. So China is aware of the fact that the EU is dealing with, with it both as an institution and as separate member states. How balanced is the relationship? China has been rising very much, but the EU has also been growing more as a cohesive unit. What are the dependencies on both sides and who needs who more? The thing of imbalances uh, of uh, of this relationship it is actually a buzzword in EU-China relations in, in recent years. That is because um, actually uh, both China is dependent on the EU in certain dim dimensions and the EU is dependent on China in certain mm -hmm. dimensions. But the relations uh, are strongly imbalanced uh, in China's favor. Mm -hmm. And um, the first uh, dimension where the, these relations are very strongly imbalanced is trade. Mm -hmm. Trade because China's um, uh, surplus with uh, with the EU, trade surplus with the EU was around uh, 400 billion euro a mm -hmm. year. It was very strong and it was due to two factors. The first one was um, uneven market access mm -hmm. that China has to the EU uh, market and that the EU companies do not have. So simply... Chinese protectionism. Exactly. Uh, and uh, the the second element of this equation is actually that China is uh, selling much surp manufacturing surpluses to the EU. Mm -hmm. And the most representative example of that is uh, EV cars. Mm -hmm. um, uh, recently, uh, in September, uh, the EU uh, launched a... Um, anti-subsidy uh, probe against China, Chinese uh, EV imports. And mm -hmm. that is... Uh, who's making the subsidies? A Chinese state. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you take a look at uh, the EU market from China's uh, perspective, you would see that the EU's market is very um, open to Chinese goods in um, many ways. But also when you compare the EU market and the level of its openness to Chinese goods and, for example, the U.S. market, you would see that, well, the EU is, is a very important player for, for Chinese goods. Mm -hmm. And um, f let's take a look, look at tariffs, for example. So in terms of EV cars, the tariffs in the EU currently are only 10%, mm -hmm. whereas in the uh, U.S. it's 27%. Mm -hmm. So the EU as a sales market for China is, is very important. The, another thing uh, that I, I would mention here is uh, the EU is a very important foreign investor for China. Mm -hmm. China is actually right now in a um, very um, difficult position after COVID in terms of its economic development and it very strongly needs foreign uh, investments mm -hmm. to to recover after uh, after the pandemic and the EU is is willing uh, still many EU companies are willing to invest uh, in China and from Chinese perspective this is very important um, in terms of their internal situation for example the youth unemployment uh, rate in China is uh, very high mm -hmm. uh, last time when the data was, were published in in June it was over 20% and i think these foreign investments 
investments from from the EU would help uh, China to to make the situation better. Is this also an explanation for uh, why there are surpluses of Chinese products that they believe they can keep their employees working and somehow sell it easily to Europe? Uh, the thing is that while the Chinese economy is slowing down, the consumption uh, in China is also weakening. Mm-hmm. And that's why China is uh, looking for other, other sales market. And um, as I mentioned, uh, the EU market is still very much open and, and, and is interested in Chinese goods. And that's why um, they are coming here. Okay. This sounds more like more of a dependency that China has mm-hmm. on the EU. So... What is the EU? Uh, what does the EU need China for? Uh, for many things, and I would say that when we talk about dependencies, what we need to realize first is that it's not a problem of the whole EU. Mm-hmm. So there is uh, no such thing as the EU's dependence on China, mm-hmm. because there are uh, huge divergences between countries. And first and foremost, there uh, is not a it's not a whole EU problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, it the dependency on uh, on China is uh, first and foremost a German problem. Not mm-hmm. only a German problem, but mostly a German problem. Uh, for example, uh, Germany's exports of goods and services to China uh, is around three uh, percent of German GDP. Mm-hmm. So it's very difficult to actually take a step back for German companies and find alternative markets. Uh, the second thing is um, that uh, certain German companies are actually very uh, strongly present uh, in China. They produce in China. Uh, China is not only the sales market, but also uh, a, a place where they do their research, when they uh, do joint ventures with Chinese companies. Mm-hmm. So they do have their business partners uh, in China, also in certain uh, strategic uh, uh, sectors. Mm-hmm. And it's very difficult for them to find another place uh, to invest. I would also say that uh, German companies have a huge presence in China. Their revenues there are around six uh, percent of German GDP, so mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a huge stake. They do cooperate with uh, Chinese uh, partners. They have joint ventures with them. With them, they produce uh, in China. This is mostly about uh, automotive sector and chemical sectors. Mm-hmm. Um, an important thing here is that. China is well aware of the fact that uh, business interests are not always in line with national interests in uh, in Germany. So, for example, before uh, Germany launched I- its uh, China strategy, uh, certain business representatives, uh, CEOs, were invited to China and um, met with uh, Minister of Commerce. So China is trying to take leverage of, of these businesses when negotiating certain policies. Another thing that is very hotly debated in the EU is dependence on uh, critical raw materials. Mm -hmm. The EU is very uh, dependent on uh, the critical raw materials that are refined in China. Around uh, uh, 98% of EU exports of of these uh, um, critical raw materials is coming from from China. Mm -hmm. And we cannot deal with our green transition, with our digital development, also with our uh, um, uh, defense uh, with strengthening our defense uh, capabilities mm-hmm. without these critical raw materials. This is uh, not an um, an easy choice, and we actually do not have a choice because the EU is very ambitious about speeding up in its cap- capabilities in refining these materials. But how can you do it when the environmental costs of this is very strong? And mm-hmm. this was def- this would this would definitely uh, create a backlash uh, in European societies if we want. To to take a part of this business back to the EU. You've spoken very much about the the trade between EU mm-hmm. and China in their relations. Is this the majority of EU Chinese relations or is it basically all of them? It's not all of them. Mm-hmm. I would say that there this is a big part of uh, the bilateral relationship because from the very beginning of the EU China relations this this relationship was about trade mm-hmm. and gradually it was evolving into something more into something much more uh, geopolitical. And right now I would say that there are uh, two uh, main areas in the EU-China relations. The first is 
um, political. And um, here I would say that the EU and China are very different in its uh, security interests. Mm-hmm. Uh, this became very clear after uh, the Russia after Russia invaded Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Uh, China was uh, supporting. Um, Russia diplomatically and economically Mm -hmm. and this is something that the EU found um, hard to accept Mm -hmm. and economically I would say that uh, in a nutshell um, the EU uh, thinks that current policies that are implemented by Xi Jinping are um, threatening the long-term competitiveness of the EU. But on the other hand China does have some criticisms of the EU that um, the EU is too much at the beck and call of the United States. Yeah, this is, um, if you look for certain um, things that haven't changed in China's perception uh, of the EU throughout the years, I think this would be a good one. That Mm -hmm. over the years, uh, China uh, has been seeing uh, the EU as um, as a vassal of, of the United States. Mm-hmm. This is not something. Although it has denied this. Absolutely, recently Xi Jinping uh, during uh, the EU China summit he denied. He said that um, that the EU is a very important actor in a multipolar world and it's not a vassal. This is very interesting because it was actually a Chinese press. Uh, that uh, created this term, EU mm. as the, the American vassal. Uh, mm, and, uh, and I think this may lead China to certain strategic uh, miscalculations if it thinks that actually uh, all changes and more assertiveness towards China is uh, made by Europe, US pressure, whereas certain of these trends are actually... Um, are actually self-made by the, by the EU. By the EU. Mm-hmm. You mentioned the EU-China summit, which was held at the end of last year. This is one of the mechanisms for cooperation. Is it the most important one? Yeah, this is the um, the mechanism that is uh, the most important uh, annual event, mm-hmm. uh, and this is a place where. Uh, where the dialogue of the EU and China uh, takes place. And I would say you, you shouldn't usually expect it to be a breakthrough in, mm-hmm. um, uh, in the bilateral relations. Mm-hmm. But this is uh, a moment where the EU and China sends messages to each other. And, uh, and we, as, as analysts, we can actually make sure where the both sides are in, in their bi- bilateral relationship. So they were rather positive messages at the last summit? The last summit, I would say, was symbolic. It was very important because it was the first summit since 2019. First face-to-face meeting between EU and uh, China uh, leaders. This was not due to a breakdown in relations. This was due to COVID. It was due to COVID and breakdown in relations after Uh Russia's invasion uh, on Ukraine. um, The summit didn't take place. Uh, Before it uh, also took place online, but it was called by Joseph Borrell, um, uh, a dialogue of the deaf. Uh, so there was uh, this this feeling uh, that actually uh, the d- dialogue is, is going nowhere. Mm-hmm. This time, I would say both sides uh, took much work uh, to prepare well. Mm -hmm. This was a well-prepared summit. Eight commissioners uh, went to China uh, prior to the summit to uh, hold uh, hold, uh, discussions with Chinese counterparts. Mm -hmm. Uh, The sides knew where they were, knew what the main problems were. Mm -hmm. uh, And uh, both of them tried to... Uh, send certain signals that would be in line with with their interests. In case of the EU, uh, Brussels was first and foremost trying to tell China that it should use all its leverage uh, over Russia Mm -hmm. to stop uh, assault against Ukraine. And the second message was that uh, the EU is ready to protect its market and its economic interests, also f- also by imposing tariffs on China. Mm-hmm. Um, 
because uh, Chinese uh, manufacturing surpluses that are exported to uh, to the EU are actually um, damaging the competitiveness of the European companies. Uh, the EU was also very open about um, uh, calling for more market openness um, uh, in uh, in China and about balancing the bilateral relationship. In terms of uh, Chinese uh, messaging, um, I would say that China, by um, uh, in Xi Jinping words, uh, China was trying to uh, ensure the EU that it's an, an still an important partner um, mm-hmm. for China, and that it has a very um, a constructive role to play in the Sino-American rivalry. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was a positive signaling. In economic dimension, China was more assertive, though. Uh, Premier Li Qiang said that the EU is, beca- the EU is becoming protectionist mm-hmm. uh, and that it's a politici- politicizing trade and mm-hmm. it's basically uh, going as uh, taking us nowhere. Um, and prior to uh, to the summit, uh, China was also signaling the EU that it's ready to uh, fire back uh, mm-hmm. if uh, the EU is uh, taking steps uh, too farther and becomes too protectionist toward mm-hmm. uh, China. And here, uh, China is using raw materials again. Uh, this is for now this is only about signaling. So China um, what China did was telling its uh, raw materials exporters to report to Ministry of Commerce where and what uh, they are uh, exporting. Mm-hmm. And also China limited export of uh, certain critical raw materials, also critical for the EU, use green transition li- like uh, graphite, uh, germanium, uh, gallium. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is something that the EU uh, um, finds uh, very important and actually h- has very little space to maneuver uh, mm-hmm. if, uh, if China continues to do so. It has very little space to maneuver at the moment. Uh, but will this stay the same? Because I heard about this policy of de-risking towards China. Yeah, there is pol- policy of de-risking. And one of the uh, messaging during uh, uh, the summit was also that it will be implemented, even though China is harshly crit- criticizing uh, mm-hmm. this policy. Mm, China is afraid of the risking and is even more afraid that the risking will become decoupling uh, with time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the EU says that the risking is actually what China has been doing over the years. Mm-hmm. So it's limiting your dependence in strategic uh, sectors uh, to boost your own uh, security uh, capabilities. And here, um, um, what we see about the risking is that it's still a work in progress. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it is materializing. Uh, we can see it by, for example, the EU um, creating anti coercion instrument that mm. is uh, protecting the EU um, from um, the economic coercion by the third countries. And mm-hmm. previously it was, for, um, for example, China, but also the US mm-hmm. that used economic coercion against the EU. Uh, and uh, the EU is also uh, um, having a, a list uh, of critical technologies that it wants to uh, protect its own technologies like semiconductors, uh, biotechnology, uh, quantum computing, and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, protect in what way? From industrial espionage? Yeah, industrial mm-hmm. espionage. Mostly here, uh, what we see is that it's also kind of a response to um, to certain activities that China made uh, in the past. Uh, but the risking is uh, the way it will be implemented is very much dependent on the EU companies because this is the EU companies that uh, have to and will uh, find ways to implement the risking. Mm-hmm. And if um, European business is reluctant to implementing the risking, to the risking from China, this will be very uh, hard to stay on the same page uh, between the business and, and, and the EU. Mm-hmm. There is some room for optimism. It seems that things are improving. What should we expect from 2024? Is it going to be an improvement? Is there going to be a lot of action uh, in EU-China relations? 2024 is going to be a year of question marks uh, Mm -hmm. in the EU-China relations, I would say. And that is because um, 
we have elections in the US, we have elections in the EU and in Taiwan. Mm. And all of these elections are very important for um, for the future of uh, EU-China relations. Mm. But what we do know now is that uh, the effectiveness of dialogue between uh, China and the EU and the future uh, tra trajectory of, of this relationship will depend on two things. I would say that the first element would be um, the relationship between uh, Russia and China, mm -hmm. uh, what way China would go because this is critical for the EU to see uh, whether China would be willing to still very strongly or even stronger support Russia or uh, to take uh, certain steps back. And the second thing here is uh, the shape of the future European Commission. Uh, we have uh, elections in autumn 2024 mm -hmm. and it uh, very much depends on whether the future uh, commission would be still focused on um, strengthening uh, its competent competitiveness towards China on whether this would be abandoned or at least wouldn't be high on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Here I think it's important to say that von der Leyen was a commissioner uh, who was very vocal about uh, China. She was the one uh, who uh, decided to uh, support a certain um uh, certain European researchers that were sanctioned by, by China. Mm. She had uh, economic uh, agenda towards China, very clear and uh, high in her priority list. But we cannot be sure that this will prevail in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, Paulina. Thanks a lot. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this discussion, why don't you watch our video on the structure of the Chinese Communist Party, which is available on screen now.